I'll share with you, I want to just start with a, with a story, a little story that I uh, know. Um, this story is about a longtime minister, and um, <clears throat> he's going to have this meeting with this young minister. And uh, the, um, the seasoned minister invites him over to his house. <clears throat> so that they can talk. And uh, there's also, he invites uh, a bunch of Bible school students to also be there. And um, there's, there's probably some uh, wrong motive a little bit in the seasoned minister in that he wants to maybe influence the Bible school students to, you know, not necessarily take everything that this <clears throat> this young minister uh, preaches and shares. And um, so uh, they're all in that room. And um, as the story goes, uh, there's also this girl, and she is uh, outside the door. And um, she's, uh, she really wasn't invited, but she's, she's kind of leaning in to the door, trying to listen to what's going on and uh, that she wants to hear the conversation. And she can tell just somewhat, you know, that it, they're asking the young minister questions and talking. And um, she perceives that maybe some, of the, maybe some of the questions are a little hard or a little harsh. Maybe not. She can't fully tell that. Um, but she can tell that it's a religious conversation, of course. And uh, she can tell another thing, and that is that all of the people there, the, the elder minister, uh, the young minister, and all the Bible school students are male. They're, they're men, so they're, they're having men talk. <clears throat> and um, she wants to be a part of that. She wants to be a part of what's going on in that meeting, and uh, she's very much conflicted about it because she wants to be a part. And uh, she's questioning within herself, you know, should I interrupt this meeting? Should I, because, you know, they've already started and everything. Should I interrupt this meeting? Should I just open the door and go in? Or, or uh, what, you know, she's just going through it because she knows also that that the thing that the Lord's doing inside of her and the reason why she's brought there, that she feels like she wanted to be there, uh, is kind of on a different basis than how the meeting is going <clears throat> inside the, the man's house, the senior minister's house. And um, so she's questioning herself and she's, she's thinking, you know, should I just step in? Should I just step in unannounced, if you can imagine that? <clears throat> uh, should I step in and ask permission to interrupt, you know, like the, go through the door and, and uh, say, can I, is it okay if I become a part of this meeting? Um, or uh, should she step in and just maybe approach the owner of the house, which is the elder minister, and um, ask him if it's all right if she's in on the meeting? Or should she just go over to the the young minister, because there's some things that he had shared that had affected her. And so she's just trying to figure out how to, how to navigate the situation. And apparently she didn't really plan it out. You know, have you ever done something like that where you're, you know, you got your, you're gonna do this, you know, and then you go, man, I, this could really mess some things up or make me look really stupid here. So, <clears throat> You know, she's thinking about, and probably a girl would really think about this, you know, well, I'm not, I don't think I'm dressed properly. They're all, they came for a meeting, and I'm not really dressed in that way. And she didn't have any real religious status either. You know, like if, if she had some religious status, she could come in and be like, oh, yeah, you know, but they, you know, it wasn't that kind of thing. But she just felt that like her heart was was drawn to what was going on. And as she's pondering those things, she's, she's worrying about, you know, well, if I do this, 
because this is the, the minister's house, the senior minister's house. If I do this, what's going to be the repercussions to me later? You know, how are people going to perceive me? What about my family? You know, are they going to catch a bunch of flack for, for me just sort of breaking into this? So she's standing there at the door trembling and conflicted, all kind of things going through mine. And Mary of Bethany faces the Valley of Decision. Uh, she has her hand on the doorknob of the corridor. And she's going through it. She's worrying. She's wondering. She doesn't know everything. She's standing there, as I said, trembling and going, well, you know, uh, what am I going to do, you know? And uh, I wrote down, will she choose the sufferings of Christ? Well, we know the answer to that, don't we? Mary does what? She goes into the fire where Jesus is. She goes into the fire where Jesus is. And her heart took her there. Her heart took her there. She doesn't avoid the fire. She could have. But her strong motivation was that she wanted to be with Jesus, the young minister, more than anything. And so, as I said, she doesn't avoid the fire. I mean, there is the fire. You see, you see if, it was just a, if it was just a situation where he was somewhere else and you could just approach him, there wouldn't be no fire. Or if you were in a group that approached him. But in this situation, she knows. She knows the fire that's about to happen. And she has to make that decision. Is this what I'm going to do? And all of the things, I, as I was talking about, that were, she was going through her mind when that was uh, coming up. So she, she goes in, and she knows what she's going to face. She's going to face accusations. She's going to face accusers. Uh, but she wants to be with him. She wants to be with Jesus where he's at, and he just happens to be in the fire, <laughs> you know. And um, and and the other part is she's she knows she has information that the others apparently don't have, and she doesn't want to miss this opportunity because to miss this opportunity. In two days, it'll be gone. It'll be completely gone. And so all of the worries, all of the thoughts, all of the fears, all of the questions, all of the what about this is and what about that and, you know, how's this going to work out and everything, it just begins to, to be overshadowed by the fact that I got two days and this is my shot. And even if, it has, if he, even if it means I have to go into the fire to be with him, I, I've got to be there. I've got to be there. So uh, when she comes in, what does she do? Remember all of the options that she was going, should I go over to the owner of the house? Should I go over to you know, the young minister, should I ask permission, should I knock, should I not do this, should I, what do I do, what do I do, you know. But she goes in, and when she goes in, she went straight to Jesus, straight to Jesus, Amen. Hallelujah. straight to Jesus. She didn't go ask any permission from the guy that owns the building. She went straight to him, okay? And she goes straight to him, and she goes straight to him and gives to him oil. 
pours it out. She comes in there, she pours it out on him. She gives to him. She pours out on him. She, she weeps tears for him. She washed him with her hair. She kissed his feet. In the midst of the fire. In the midst of the fire, she's doing what nobody else was doing. She's doing it on the information that she knows that in two days he's going to be crucified. And she's doing it for his burial. But she's weeping. And she's loving. And she's not thinking of herself. But once she did all of this, 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 she went straight to him. She gave him. She poured out. She wept tears. She washed him. She kissed his feet. Once she did that, then the accusations come. That's when they came. That started the whole thing. So let me warn you, don't put Jesus first unless you want to get in the fire with him. <laughs> but if you want him in a way that no, none of those others would have him, at least not up to that point, to be with him, for him, then go into the fire knowingly go into the fire knowingly so what were the accusations well you know you know the story you know the accusations right i mean they were uh, why this waste you remember that one waste waste you know what about the poor the poor should have been taken care of we could have taken this this perfume this oil, this ointment, and we could have blessed so many people. But all she's thinking about is two days. I got two days. What can I do in two days? What can I give in two days? What do I have I can pour out? She could have, she could have looked around and said, oh my God, I, I don't have anything. I don't have anything. I, what is, you know, you, we do this, don't we? I don't, I don't have anything. I'm so empty. I'm just, I don't have anything to pour out on him. But she went, what do I, what do I give him? And she thinks about the most expensive thing she's got. This is going on Jesus. This is for him. And I won't have it after this time, but I won't have him either. She doesn't know the whole picture. So she's just doing what? What she could. She's doing what she could. Isn't that amazing? Oh, maybe she even thought, well, once I start pouring this expensive stuff out, everybody's going to like me. Yeah. Right? I mean, you know, they go, oh. Wow, such devotion. Oh, this is some. Don't be fooled. You're going into the fire. It's going to cost you. And you say, I know, it's costing me the perfume. <laughs> it's going to cost you a lot more than that. But the, but the payoff is, we, we haven't got to the payoff yet. We'll, we'll talk about it. By the way, I didn't give you a title for this. The title of this is Mary Bethany Meets Peter. No, 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 not the one in the room, one of the Bible school students. Not, not, not that Peter. It wouldn't do her any good right now to meet that Peter. He's shaking his head just saying, what a waste. Remember in one of the, the Gospels it said, it, it mentioned that um, uh, all the disciples agreed. And another one it says, Judas brought it up. But the other one says, They're all, they all agree. Yeah, this is, you know, this is our ministry. This is what we're going to do. Peter was saying yes to that. Not that Peter. First Peter. 
If you're still in the dark, the book of 1 Peter. We've already kind of showed our hand, haven't we? Mary Bethany meets Peter. So let's get into that. So what exactly, what exactly were the sufferings? Okay, they spoke evil of her. They spoke evil of her relationship with the Lord, of how she chose to go after him. Amen. That ever happened to you or somebody <laughs> did that? First Peter 2.12 says, having your conversation or your manner of life, the way that you relate to him, um, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. So there, all this cruel treatment that, that they're doing to her was because she gave to Jesus, because she poured out to Jesus, because she... She, I mean, one reason why I tried to paint this picture for us at the very beginning is, you know, because we, we, we have no record of her when she came into the room, and we have no record of her standing at the door, but at some juncture she stood at the door of the corridor of the sufferings of Christ knowing I've got to do, I'm going to do something here, or I'm not going to, and she's... She's, she's weighing, she's, she's counting the cost, you know, um, or the, you know, you know how sometimes you do it, you say, okay, so here's the pros over here and here's the cons, okay? So pro, I'm going to get to be with Jesus. Con, everybody will hate me. They'll look down on me the rest of my life. I'll make my brother and sister look bad, Lazarus and Martha. Uh, they'll think, you know, I mean, she, she might even go, what is he going to think? Jesus, the young minister, he was just a little over his late 20s, right? I mean, because we always think of him, the pictures of Jesus most of the time have him really a, a lot older looking. He's in his early 30s. She don't know but she knows in her heart what she wants to do. She knows in her heart how, how he has affected her. She'd already sat at his feet before. Right? She heard his word, and it, it mesmerized her. It drew her. It it, it, it did things in her that no other preacher had. And she said, and, and she was with the disciples when Jesus told her in two days. Jesus said this to him. You can check it out. Jesus said in two days, the Son of Man is going to be crucified and stuff. So she's showing up. She's there knowing that what, whatever is about to happen, I have to do this. I have to go in the fire. I've got to go. And that's why I use the door. That's why I use the picture of her outside the door, entering the court of sufferings. Entering and, and, and all this fire and all this flame coming up around her. But she went ahead in. She went ahead in. She went in. So, 1 Peter 2.19 says, For this is thankworthy if a man or a woman, for conscience sake toward God, toward Jesus, toward the young preacher, endure grief, suffering wrongfully. This is thankworthy. So, so she hit on something that was important to his heart. She was affected in such a way that it drew, it didn't repel. Okay? 
So then the other part was, and I, from the very first time I really started understanding this story till now, I've always been affected by the fact that she didn't seem motivated or moved by anything that was going on around her. You know, did you ever think of that? And did you ever think, you know, how, how can you do that? Well, it's easy. Your focus. Your focus is him. Your focus is on him. You, you're, you're like a horse with the, I forget what they're called. Blinders. Well, I would think if they were blinders, they'd be like this, but that's nevertheless. <laughs> Focused so that nothing around you is, is bothering you. But there's a, there's, a, there's a greater reality maybe she doesn't even know yet <laughs> that's going to really benefit her in the long run. So she wasn't moved by the attack. First Peter 3, 14 through 16, but, and if you suffer for righteousness sake, happy are you, and be not afraid of their terror. Be not, you, that's, did you hear that? She wasn't motivated or moved or scared or whatever. Be not afraid of their terror. Okay, okay. Could we say it another way? Don't be afraid of the flames that are licking around you because you won't even have the smell of smoke on you. Remember the three Hebrew children going in there to be with Jesus and you don't even have that smell of smoke. You don't, not only that, but you are walking around with Jesus. I'm with him, fellowshipping in the flames. I mean, there's several different ways you could fellowship in the flames. You could say, you could be in there with Jesus, like the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, and you could be, you'd be in there and go, oh, there's a, there's a nice looking flame over there. Oh, and look, here's, oh, the way these are falling, that's so nice. It's very artistic, you know. <laughs> you can fellowship in, in how beautiful the flames are. Or you're fellowshipping with Jesus in the flames, and you're not noticing the flames, because your heart is on him and his heart is on you and you just don't notice what's going on around you. That's Mary of Bethany. That's Mary of Bethany. 1 Peter 4.19 says, Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Just commit it to the Lord. <laughs> Just give it to Jesus. Just be with Jesus. And, you know, you know the rest of the story so that you know Jesus was also focused on her. Right? I mean, they were together in the fire. <laughs> and here's a beautiful thing, too, about, about her. She will never... Never speak up to justify herself. She'll never do it. She'll never do it. Mm. Wow. First Peter 2, 21 through 23 says, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. There she is. She's in the corridor. She's not, you know, you, you, you do remember the big strong men in the, in the fiery furnace in, in the book of Daniel, and they're trying to throw these guys in, and somehow the flames, because when you throw somebody in a fiery furnace, you're throwing them head first, right? Or you got one guy over here who has got his shoulders, and the guy's got his feet here, and you're doing this. <laughs> but one way or the other, they should get it first. But it, the flames went around them, and got these big old strong guys. We've got strength. 
Your strength just melted. So did your muscles and stuff. I'll read it again. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should walk in his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. Again. When he suffered, when he suffered, when he was suffering, when he was suffering, when he was suffering, he threatened not. See, that's the difference many times between our understanding and experience or what we would assume is the experience of the sufferings of Christ is that we, when somebody reviles or somebody does this or accuses us or does all these things, they, we have no recourse. Maybe they're bigger, they're stronger, they're more... They know more people. They have more influence to, to sway the crowds against you, against me, against us. So we have to just take it. But the beauty, the biggest part of this, this aspect is that Jesus had the power. He could have called 10,000 angels. He had the power. I mean, it's one thing if you, you know... <laughs> If you have absolutely no power and they're just come breaking down on you, you probably ought to just, you know, check the numbers and check everything and go, okay, I'm going to be humble. You know, because it's so many, so much, so strong, so convinced against you. You just go, I'm sorry. <laughs> but Jesus, Jesus, you know, he said, I could have called 10,000 angels. He could have called 10,000 angels and said, okay, guys, I'm not going to use you, but I want them to see that you're here. Right? And they go, okay, 10,000 is more than the 15 of us that's against her or him. So what about Jesus? What about the attack on Jesus? It, uh, turn to Luke chapter 7. And here we see specifically that Jesus, there was an attack on Jesus also at the same time. Luke 7, verse, uh, starting with verse 36. This also particular uh, gospel using these particular wordings help us understand who the, uh, the elder minister was. Verse 36, and one of the Pharisees desired him, okay, see, that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house. That's the older minister. So I didn't make that up. <clears throat> and he went into the, uh, the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet, meaning we're going to eat, Okay. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the uh, Pharisee's house, and this is where I was looking at it and going, I think she came later. I don't think she had an invitation. And I think she came later because she, when she knew that Jesus was in the house, she went to the house. And she probably went to the door. And back then, they didn't have insulation and everything like, you know, we do. And they probably, she probably is leaning there going, okay, is this, should I go in? Okay, that's not a good time right there, what they're talking about. Okay, I'm listen. That's not a good time either. Okay, there is going to be no, two days are going to be gone if I don't do something quickly. So, so, so. She was probably there uh, or on the way there once she heard, thinking about all of these issues about the fire and the flames. I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I... 
you know, no other church is asking us. They're telling us the flames will be put out, you know, or whatever, you know. <laughs> well, I'm telling you that the flames won't hurt you. Not if, you, not if you're Mary Bethany, not if you're three Hebrew children. You say, yeah, but I'm, you should know what I'm doing, Randy. <laughs> God's really mad at me. Okay, then don't go in. <laughs> Actually, just get your focus on Jesus, amen? Just do that. Um, <clears throat> and behold, a woman in the city which was the center, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet, um, behind him weeping. Okay, now verse 38, be honest with you, has messed with me before. Has it ever messed with you? Verse 38 and on there. Uh, it says, she stood at his feet behind him, yeah. weeping, and began to wash his feet with her tears. Okay, she's like leaning over his shoulder behind him, Dropping tears on her, and she's, her hair is so long that she's shaking it over his feet. I mean, okay, so I assume that she was behind him and beside him and in front of him and just pouring on Jesus, okay? <clears throat> Weeping and began to wash his feet with her tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. And verse 39, now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it. Okay. Maybe this guy was, you know, maybe he had junk against Jesus. That's the reason why he invited him there in the first place. Maybe he didn't, but we do see for sure all of this junk comes up in him when he's seeing what's going on here. You know, what is this? How is this of God? Jesus. Jesus just listens to him. When he saw it, he spake within himself. Anybody heard that little phrase recently? Spoke within herself. Sarah. Sarah did the same thing. We need to stop thinking that he's not paying attention to as, as I said, all the bats in your belfry. Okay, he's, he's, he's got little windows and doors that he can open up stairs and go, woo! Look at all that. <clears throat> Spake within himself saying, this man, you, get, you, you see those two words, this man, you know, I am a seasoned minister, and I would never allow this. But this man, this young whippersnapper, excuse my Texan, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him. For she is a sinner. Oh, my God. Thank God we're all so clean and pure and perfect. So he's, he's just like, I mean, this, this is like, I don't know how he held it in. You know what I'm saying? I mean, really, if you, if you think about it, I don't know how he held all that in, but he thought this within himself. Um, and... The point of me going to these scriptures was to point out that Jesus was accused also, just like Mary, which means what? They were in the fire together. The scripture's trying to show us that he's in the fire there with you when it comes to the sufferings of Christ. He's there. I mean, if you let that, you know, what did Jesus say? What It was uh, also in Luke, what, I forget, nine or something like that. And he says, let these sayings sink down into your ears. Okay, I remember reading that when I was in Bible school and going, okay, I'm going to take longer time. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, it's, it's like 
molasses, you know, you can pour it on bread, but it takes a while to sink into the bread, right? You're going, what's molasses? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> it's just thicker. So is our head. It's just thicker. <laughs> it's just thicker. Ooh, seven people just dropped out just then. Not really. I'm kidding. All right. <clears throat> um, so they're in the fire together. Well, 1 Peter 4.14, the last part says, on their part, he's evil spoken of, meaning the Pharisee and the ones who are the accusers. On their part, he, Jesus, is evil spoken of, but on your part, he's glorified. God. Apparently, Mary of Bethany met 1 Peter. All right. So, in the end of this story, everything turns. Everything turns. Okay. okay. In the end of the story, in Daniel of the three Hebrew children, in the end of it, everything turns. Right? In the scriptures that I'm going to eventually read again, or, or everything will turn. There is a reality of what God is after, and we think it's just to put us through sufferings. No, no, and no, no. It is, it is to get us of a same heart with him, to be with him in his sufferings. Why? Why would, you know, why would, we, why would he want that? Well, first of all, let's just consider we had communion today. Well, they had, they had it on the same day uh, that he was crucified. On the same day he took bread. And da, 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 da. Uh, they had it on the same day. And he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, which they went to quite a bit and apparently was like their little prayer room. What's the name of the thing we're going to call this back here? The... the Prayers within the sensor. We're not talking about technology sensors that says you just came into the room. We're talking about the thing that held the fire in his presence. So let's turn to um, Matthew chapter 26. This is uh, Matthew's version. And I'm only picking it up at this certain point, and that is... That everything that has happened so far, all the things that happened within her to get her into the corridor, listen carefully, did you hear that? Everything that happened within her to get her to the corridor, uh, everything that all the accusations that have arisen and the basis of their way of thinking, whether it's this is, um, this is what a waste this is, which was disciples, to what the Pharisee said, to all the accusations, all of that comes now to this point right here. And this is Jesus is going to speak up for her. Hmm. Matthew 26, verse 10. I like these first four words. When Jesus understood it. <laughs> I, thought, I thought Jesus knew everything. What do you mean when he understood it? Well, he does, he does know everything, but he doesn't understand the way we think. I mean, come on. Can I get an amen, a hearty, high old silver, something? Uh, <laughs> Jesus... He's like, what are they talking about? Can you, can you imagine if he's, and we're going to quote him here in a minute. Can you imagine if Jesus is sitting there thinking, what are these people talking about? What do they mean? I mean, this is, this is, this is beautiful. This is glorious. What? Oh, oh, that's the way they think. So that's the way they think. 
I'm leaving in two days. I'm out of here. Sakalavaka. That's for my Jesus tribe in Houston. <laughs> Celia and all of her family and sisters have heard that since they were little girls when I would come down there and preach. All right. So when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? Why are you troubling her? Why are you doing this to her? Why are you saying these things? Why is this going on? If he, if he just now started to understand it, then he's asking why? 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 For she hath wrought a good work upon me. That's what he's saying. Why is she doing it? Because she's wrought a good work upon me. For you have the poor always with you, but me you have not always. Or me, not always. Me, this is Jesus. Me, not always. It's like he's saying, I'm here right now. I'm here right now. So she's responding like I'm here right now. And you are acting like the poor are, are more important than the fact that I, you won't see me in two days. For in that she hath poured, for in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial, my burial. So Jesus is fully aware, I'm not going to be around in two days. And you, he's also fully aware, you're not aware. You don't seem to be getting this. Verse 13, Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world. Do you know that I think almost every, there's, there's at least, I think four different versions of this, or not versions, but tellings of it. I was shocked that the whole world kept being used. The whole world. It wasn't the world. It was the whole world. Okay. So if something's big, it would go to the whole world. <laughs> you know what I mean? It would go to the whole world. Well, this, is, this wasn't just a little one-time room thing in your house, buddy. This, this is going to the whole world. <laughs> that really, to me, is just amazing. There shall also this. I like these words. There shall also this, that this woman hath done will be told for a memorial of her. A memorial of her. All right. So that's why Jesus could, was, was having to do a little adjusting there to understand because then when Jesus understood it, when Jesus understood, then he says this stuff, is because to him, this is, this is greater than the whole world. It's greater. It's the greatest thing that could have happened. It's wonderful. It, is, it, it was for him. It was for, it was for his burial. It was for, you know, it was a pouring out. I mean, if you knew you were going to die in two days, and you told everybody, because <laughs> he did. He told everybody. And if you knew that and everybody was like, um, well, maybe Randy, maybe you should, um, uh, you know, your your house needs painting. <laughs> maybe you should, you know, think about doing that. Buy buy some paint next week, and we'll show up and help you. I'd be going. I think I told y'all, I'm I'm going to be gone in two days. Yeah, we know, but we'll help. And then you go, oh, now I understand it. You people don't listen. That's what I understand. I'm sorry. Uh, so in the face of accusations, we, we know. She didn't rail back. She didn't glorify herself. Um, 
she glorified him and not herself. But he, but Jesus, in front of all of those that were in the room, in front of them, he glorifies her. She does not glorify her. Think about it. She, but he rises up in the end of it, and he glorifies her in front of evildoers. She is found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 7, and this is, we go, the appearing in the sky. No, this is at the appearing at the end of the corridor. You see that? It is. It, he's, he's quiet. There, he's letting them talk. And, you know, they say, well, this could have been done for this and that and all this. And, you know, this other guy over here, the, the, the seasoned preacher, saying all of his stuff. Jesus is letting them talk because he's her Adonai. He'll speak up at the right time. He knows how. But that's why he didn't speak up before. He's not there to get rid of the flames. He's there to bring you into it and through it with him. When they pass through the fire, what's it say? Thou shalt not be burned. Pass through the waters, shall not overtake you. She is found under praise and honor by him and glory at his finally standing up and saying something. In the end, Jesus was her Adonai. He appeared at the end of the trial. All right, so this is, this is my first closing coming right here. should be pretty quick except for some reading. <clears throat> um, what was the effect on the disciples? Because, I mean, if you think about it, that's kind of embarrassing for Jesus to have to say all of that about something that they didn't get. So I said, surely the disciples must have been ashamed after Jesus' words concerning her. First Peter says, having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good way of life in Christ. In the end, the disciples suffered how? First Peter 4.15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, they didn't murder, or as a thief, they didn't steal anything, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's business. Jesus, he goes, okay, don't be a murderer. Don't be a thief. And stop butting into my business with my people that I hold precious to me Amen? Yes, Lord. You know? Because it's amazing to me that he mentions murderers and thieves, and then goes, okay, you guys, you're my disciples. You're in with them. You're busybodies in other people's matters. <clears throat> Jesus had to correct them openly. Why? For misjudging the thing that he greatly honored. Misjudging the thing he greatly honored. All right, so Mary of Bethany becomes the standard. Well, the disciples weren't. They were the rebukees. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a word, right, Mallory? Rebukee. It is now, see. How, have you kept track of how many words I've made up in our... <laughs> she's the standard. She's the example. She's the example to all generations in the whole world, throughout the generations in the world. Okay. <laughs> so if she's the standard, what would she say to us now? 
Well, since she met Peter, let's see if she says something like this. 1 Peter 1.13, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Meaning him coming forth at the end when you went through the corridor, you get to go to the last section of the corridor, which is him appearing. Woo! All right. Well, that's not all. She would also say this. Beloved, stink it not, oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> stink it not up. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings in the fire. She was in there over and over. You see a picture of that. Um, but rejoice in as much as you're partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. This is Mary talking to us because she met first Peter. All right, here's my summation. And this is my second ending and probably the last because it's just reading. First Peter 4, 1, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 6. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. You see, anybody see a contrast there between the disciples and Mary of Bethany? Okay, be subject one... Be subject one to another. Well, we're not going to be subject to her. She needs to be subject to us. We're disciples. No, you're Bible school students at this point. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> That's really all they were. And not very good ones. But they will be. Um, so be subject. Clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, you disciples. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, which she did. Which means when she put her hand on the knob, doorknob to enter in the corridor, she saw it through. She went all the way through the process till it came to the end, so that he may exalt you in due time. You say, well, he, it just seems to take so long. When is he, when is he going to exalt me? Well, it depends on what attitude you ask that in. <laughs> if you're going, well, when is he going to exalt me, man? I, I've been ready for a long time. He's going, and it's going to be a long time. <laughs> that would be what he would say. But if you say, I'm with you, Lord. I just want to be with you. I just want what you want. <clears throat> But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, established, strengthened, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then this last, this is, I think, the very last of, of 1 Peter. By Silvus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that, First Peter, this is the true grace of God. When you go through that fire with him, then you have experienced the true grace of God, wherein you stand. And then he says, this is the last verse, the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you. Okay, <clears throat> I wonder if he's not talking about people that are like the captives, because I don't know that Babylon was still going. I mean, they were wiped out. What? How many, how many beasts were there in Daniel? You know, wiped out, wiped out further, and wiped out, and wiped out further, and, you know, uh, so that... You know, even now it's not called Babylon, it's called Iraq, right? But he's saying 
the church that is at Babylon. That is, they're captives, as it were, in spirit. Maybe they're not locally at Babylon, is what I'm trying to say. They have become captives. They have gone through this situation that, that God was trying to get Judah to go through. And this word, this whole book, was to them, you, Mary of Bethany, all of us, so that we would pass through that corridor just like Israel, just like Daniel and the three Hebrew children, because they did, Ezekiel, all of them in a right spirit, And be with him in his sufferings instead of making it about your sufferings. Amen. Well, let's, let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that your heart is ever, ever reaching out to us. Uh, and that we see in Jesus Toward Mary of Bethany, we see not that he is moved by great ministries or our greatness of, of uh, what we are doing for you in terms of ministry, but he's moved by a heart that cares, that sees not just our own stuff, but sees your stuff and a willingness to break with all of the flow that religion seems to want us to be stuck in the, in the ruts of it, but to break out of those ruts, start living free and, and free enough that we know, we learn that we are free from the fear of the fire, but instead we are learning to be with you, learning that your intention for the fire is not to destroy us. Your intention, like with Mary of Bethany, would be to build a memorial when it's all said and done. Father, I just thank you so much that you are preparing us, not, not just for the gathering, but to be able to view circumstances as not just circumstances. Not strange fire, not the devil or just about being mean people who are doing this, but being about opportunities for us to be with you, to show our love to you in the worst of circumstances for us, and yet making, making it the joy of our heart to be with you and to turn to turn our circumstances from our sufferings to just be with you. We do love you. We want you deeper. And Father, for those who are yet fearful or don't understand, Father, in your timing, open your heart and open your word and this is not just found in one book of the Bible, 1 Peter, Father. It is throughout. And Father, we, we've been in the study of 1 Peter for a while, and maybe no one ever really saw Mary of Bethany going through the corridor, going through the fire, and being with you in it. But there she was. There she stood. There she was on her face. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
What a, what a, a, a thing it must have been to her as she remembered two days later getting to kiss your feet only to see now that there's a stake driven into those feet and that she got the opportunity to kiss them when they were whole, when they could be, when the feeling and the care could be felt. Thank you. Thank you, Father. We love you. Dismiss us now in your spirit and in your heart and in your flow. Father, may each of our Jesus tribe, may each of us continue to be a blessing to those around us. Whether we're, whether we're away in Belgium or Holland or Ireland or, or other states or other cities in Texas, that we could send forth that sweet savor of Christ to those that are around us. And more and more can be drawn to you, not, not the Jesus tribe here or New Creation Fellowship or Randy Nussbaum, God forbid, but to you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.